That is the wrong way. That is the right way. Zeus says good morning. Say good morning. Can you hear that? <laughs> She's purring. Somewhat reluctantly. She's purring. This way. We're good. Three, two, one. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Today is Friday, June 19th, 20. And this is my first cup of coffee. I decided to use a picture of the fuzz as the the photo for uh, for the episode. It might be the like the, only the second time it wasn't a picture of my face. Been doing the show long enough that I'm running out of angles to make this difference, so I figured just take a picture of her. She's been on the show all week, haven't you? Oh. Joys of having a cat. I slept terribly. I slept absolutely terribly. Um, so I have an attic. Most houses have an attic. Frank says, hi, Jeremy. I'm glad I did the Tupac episode yesterday. I'm extremely glad. Thank you, Frank. It meant a lot to me. And there's actually a comment from Frank on yesterday's episode that I'll, I'll read in a little bit. Um, so looking at that, I have an attic, and as with most attics, it's difficult to keep critters out. The age of this house, the way it's built, I'm never going to keep critters out. So, periodically, something will get in there. Mouse, squirrel, chipmunk, one of those small rodent-y things. And they decide to scurry around and chew in the middle of the night, right over, right in the spot, right over my bed. And that happened last night. Now, unfortunately, I've tried a number of things to deal with this, and there's only one that works, and it involves putting poison up. And so I have a, a bucket of bait blocks, and before I go to work today, I will throw a bunch of those up there, and the problem will be gone for a while. I hate doing it. I absolutely hate doing it. I hate killing things. But it comes down to the life of a squirrel or my ability to sleep and not go insane and murder people. I choose me over the squirrels. So that wasn't great. But we have a solution. Uh, the deck on the back of the house is supposed to get finished tonight. I got a text from, from my buddy. Well, what are you doing? She's got a match. She didn't want me to touch it up. Uh, what happened yesterday? Went to the gym. Had the massage therapist work on my neck and my shoulder, and I feel much, much better. Client meeting. Did a bunch of work. Started writing out some of the programming for the fight conditioning program. That's going well. That I, I feel like that's on track. Um, what else? I don't know. There's not much else. Just working. Right? Working, emails, setting stuff up. You're on camera. Toast? You don't drink coffee. She'll try to put her tail in my coffee, though. This is uh, one of the last days with the client. Uh, yes, Frank, I do want to hear a bad cat joke. Uh, so this client with the office, we're going virtual, and office is shutting down on the 30th. Next Wednesday is pretty much the last day of getting work done. <laughs> do you want to hear a bad cat joke? Just kidding. I like that. That's good. So I'll be up there today. Today, Monday, Thursday, Friday of next week, and then 
I think Monday and Tuesday of the following week. So we're almost done. And once it's done, I will. In fact, I'll be driving very little. Oh, I got the, the, there were some revisions to my Lemon Law stuff for my car that I had to go out yesterday. I did that. 2020 has been a great year. Man, I hope it gets better. It's been a tough year on everyone. Not, not thrilled. Not thrilled at all. But I've got a deck going on. All my plants are outside, except for the aloe. The aloe's got to get planted. Um, i got to get some soil for that. And that, that stops me from putting it out there. But the rubber tree and the avocados and the palms are outside. They're very, very happy about that. I'm probably not the only one who can feel when plants are happy. You can just tell. You can just tell when they're happy. Now we got some stuff that you guys wrote in. Let's see what it is. The very pixely live stream image of the cat. Cat next to a cat. That's you. That's a test of, um, of intelligence among animals is the ability to be self-aware. And obviously human beings have it. I think all, not all, most primates have it, but there are a couple other animals that have that. You know what I've read is a really smart creature that we wouldn't think of is crows. And the reason I'm thinking of crows is because there is a small flock, aka a murder of crows, that has moved in around here. And they're the most obnoxious animals. And I saw one of them in some manner of conversation with the other five out on the lawn. And the one ended up in the yard, jumping up and down, like trying to express something. I don't know. I don't speak crow. That was interesting. I hope they go away, or at least decide to be less loud. So that was just a bonus joke from Frank. Thanks, Frank. But the joke's for Fun Day Friday. How do you get a squirrel to like you? Just act nuts. Why are cats so good at video games? They have nine lives. So yesterday's episode was um, some quotes and lyrics from Tupac's music. Um, I want to say a person who meant a lot to me, and I, I guess I can say it that way. You know, I'm not pretending I knew him personally. Uh, but I got emotional, and Frank said, Please don't apologize if you get emotional during one of the episodes. You have nothing to be ashamed of. You have a right to your own feelings just like anybody else. Well, thank you. I, I agree, and I appreciate that. Having an old cat that doesn't groom herself is pretty much nonstop grooming. Pulling mats. And here's what we got for today. A kata is not fixed or immovable. Like water, it's ever-changing and fits into the shape of the vessel containing it. However, kata are not some kind of beautiful competitive dance, but a grand martial art of self-defense, which determines life and death. Kenwa Mabuni. I don't know Kenwa Mabuni, but I agree. The thing that I think people don't get about forms is how varied they can be, how personal they can be. They say that an artist, or a musician, sorry, a musician, the best musicians play the space between the notes. That's what great forms are. It's the space between the movements. And that's something I've been talking about for a few years. Every form has some manner of right way to do it, depending on the school style, whatever. You step over here, you're in this stance, you do this technique. And 
And there's even a way to get from one to the next. But what about the space between? What about the difference in the timing of the foot going down and the punch going out? What about the expression on the face? What about the tension? There are a significant number of nuances that you can look at. And if you look at the way two people, even within the same school, do the same form, there's difference. Even if you look at me, synchronized forms, which is a competitive division in some tournaments, you'll see that if you look closely enough, the people who are synced up still have some slightly different aspects. It could be the way that, you know, a hand flourishes. It could be the angle that the elbow rides out at for certain techniques. It, it, it's, it's there. It's always there. And that's what makes that division challenging, is that they're trying to synchronize absolutely every aspect of what they're doing. I think that's really cool. But here in the quote, it's talking about the self-defense aspect of a form. Here's the part where I think people, that I think people forget about with forms. People talk about bunkai, the application. Great. That's awesome. That's important. Why in most schools... does a student learn a sequence of movements early on? Because it's something they can practice. Because it's something that they can refer to. It's playing your scales in music. It's... Do I know anything else well enough? I don't, I don't really know music. It, by, by having that form to refer back to, if you're doing it enough you learn those techniques, you learn sequences. You have those things that you can do to defend. If you take pinyon, heon, shodan, whatever you might call it, you know, the, the basic karate form, block, punch, block, punch, high block, high block, high block. If someone throws a kick at you, if you've practiced that enough, you will see that if you step in and block it and step through to punch, there's an opportunity there instead of stepping back to block and moving away. A lot of the blocking techniques, if not most of the blocking techniques and forms travel forward. Most of us travel backwards when we spar. Why? it's safer in the moment, but it doesn't help you in the exchange. So when we look at forms, we can take that that sequence of movements and we can apply it. And not necessarily, not just in a, a, a bunkai sense, uh, not just in a practical application sense, but in a repetitive training sense. It's saying your ABCs. It's singing the Pledge of Allegiance. It's all these things that become ingrained if you do them enough. How many of you, if you stepped to the left and threw a, a low block, a downward block, would really want to throw a straight punch after? But quite a few of you. The more complicated and restricted the method the less opportunity for expression of one's original sense of freedom. Bruce Lee. Yeah, because you're spending all of your time, you're spending your time working on the complexities. You have a finite amount of energy and focus that you can devote to things. And if you're devoting it to the complexity, there's no space 
to be yourself. It's the guitarist versus the one man band. The one man band's putting everything he's got into playing all these different instruments. The guitarist can move around and can look and make facial expressions and can make sure they're staying in, in, in time with the rest of the band. Right? One of the words that I've, I've come to appreciate something is elegant when it is simple and effective. It's simple but beautiful. It doesn't need to be more complicated. And I think a lot of what we do in martial arts passes over the elegant. Superfoot Bill Wallace's system is elegant. It comprises three kicks. Uh, we'll say three to four core elements of footwork and four punches. That's it. It's the entire system. And you might look at that and say, well, that's too restrictive. There's not enough content there. There's not enough um, variety. The man went undefeated at 23 and 0. Generally regarded as the greatest kicker of all time. Oh, and remember, he only worked one side. Clearly, it doesn't have to be complex. There are some schools that have 40, 50 forms. And then there are others that have three. I know someone who said that everything that they've, that they need to teach comes from one form, which uh, in their school is called Teki Shodan. Um, I know it is Nahanshan. It's the cut, it's the form that you do along the wall. It's all side to side. There's a ton of stuff in there. And I think that the lesson that comes out of that is, are you overcomplicating things in life and training? Take it back to the basics. The basics are fundamental. They're foundational. It's what you build everything else on. The stronger your base, the more you can add, but you don't have to. How solid is a big, concrete, expansive, one-story building? It's not going to fall over. Relatively easy to maintain. And then think about towers. They fall, they lean. A lot more work. Pyramids work because there's a really solid base and you can build at an appropriate angle. As a lifelong practitioner of martial arts, I'm trained to remain calm in the face of adversity and danger. Steven Seagal. It's unfortunate that Steven Seagal has um, become the target of a lot, so much criticism. But we won't get into that. Remain calm in the face of adversity and danger. To me, that's not a quote about fighting or self-defense. It's a quote about life. We face adversity every day. We face danger in varying levels frequently. <laughs> Talk about minor danger, things that would get your heart rate up. Probably happens a few times a week. You're in the car and 
something's going on and <gasps> I get startled. What happens? I would love to commission a study. There, there are so many studies that I want to do around martial arts and martial arts training. You know, for example, accident rates among the general population versus martial artists. Car accident rates. My theory is that martial artists who have spent a significant time training would get into fewer car accidents. It's a lot of work that would go into that study and you know, I don't have, I would assume, the couple hundred thousand dollars it would take to do those surveys. Maybe someday. Because I believe if we show statistically all of these things that martial artists fare better in, car accidents, health, longevity, cancer rate, I don't know. I don't know what other data we can pull out. But the car accident one I'm pretty confident in. I expect that would make some people step into martial arts. And that's my goal. More people train. I should go watch Above the Law again. It's been a long time. Do not fall into the trap of thinking that just because a kata begins to the left that the opponent is attacking from the left. Mm. The more um, the more flexibility you're willing to take with the application of the forms, the bunkai, and I apologize, I don't know a term for bunkai in other languages. I'm sure there is one. So I, when I say, I try to say bunkai in application at the same time. I try not to be style specific, as I think you all know. If we take that example of step to the left, low block, straight punch. If somebody was here right now, I could show you how you could step in with a kick straight on, and I could execute a low block to the left and punch with some slight adjustment and turn that into a block and a throw. Right. Yeah. We'd want mats. You would be your leg would get stretched and you would definitely fall. Less of a throw, more of a forced stumble. One of the most enjoyable drills I did growing up was we would have group bunkai. It was a karate class, so I'll call it bunkai. And one person would go in the middle, and they would do the form. And they would do the form as close to the form as they could and still work within the attacks that the people around them were doing. The people around them, their job was to not come up with ridiculous stuff, but to have a little bit of variety. So if we take, again, low block punch, that could be you step in with a front kick. It could be a back kick. Is it likely to be a back kick? No, but that, that wasn't the point. This was usually in the kids' class that we did this, but it happened in the adult class too. And the intent was it helped us on both sides understand the form better and what it could be. And now, for example, anybody who has done Taekwondo and knows oops, sorry, I said, W blocks, which are the most ridiculous block on the planet, I understand that the encyclopedia says you are blocking two people. Nobody would ever step in between two people and block, put their arms up to block both of them. That's ridiculous. I'm unaware of a W block existing outside of Taekwondo. There's a throw there. I could show it to you. 
somebody steps in with a kick, scoop, scoop the kick, and there's the push. I believe there's another level, another layer to Taekwondo that the encyclopedia doesn't go into. So if I was going to give homework, remember when I used to give homework in these episodes? If I was going to give homework, it would be to take a form. And yeah, you're, there's a good chance that your school tells you, here are the movements that you're doing, and here's why you're doing them, because here's what you're attacking, defending, etc. Great. And I'm not telling you to stop doing that, or not believe that, or ignore that. It's important. Continue. What do you think? Do you think there's another way of doing that movement? Do you think there's a better interpretation of what that movement does? I believe some forms were constructed not with actual application in mind, but simply to practice sequences. If you look at the Taekwondo forms, there are certain patterns in, these are the ITF forms, those are the ones I know. There are certain patterns in the construction of the form that Okay, in this form we're practicing this, this, and this. In this form we're practicing this, this, and this. It's a very militaristic uh, layout. I think I finally mastered the coffee. 190 degrees, two heaping tablespoons, pinch of salt, cat on the lap. We've got another 90 degree day. I gotta go water some plants. This is the challenge in putting plants out. They're harder to water. But I'm going to go do that. Now, I hope you have a great day. It is Friday, after all, so I'm not going to see you until Monday. If everything goes right, knock on wood, we will do an episode of First Cup from the porch. The new deck. Maybe Monday. We'll see. Depends on if everything gets done. But I think so. I'm supposed to go to a body of water tomorrow. Be that a river, reservoir, I'm not sure. It's going to be hot. Uh, I don't know that we officially broke 90 degrees. Mm. Frank says, I love what one guest said. Practice doesn't make perfect, it makes permanent. Yes. And it's interesting that that concept right there, that is the heart of the programs that we're doing at Whistle Kick. You take a look at the strength and conditioning program, you take a look at the speed program and the new fight conditioning program. It's all based around the things you practice in the way you practice become permanent or at least more ingrained. I don't know that we broke 90 on Wednesday. We did yesterday. We're supposed to break it today and tomorrow we could have like a six day stretch of 90 degree weather if not it's going to be really close you know 88 87 so that's hot we don't get a lot of that up here in Vermont but it's been a nice summer so far so I'm going to go swimming I hope you have a great weekend whether you go swimming or work or train or sleep whatever you do have a great weekend and I'll see you back here on Monday Drop me some questions, drop me some comments, things you want me to respond to, and I will do that. And of course, if you're new, make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications. Thank you to all the Patreon supporters, all of you who have purchased things at whistlekick.com with the code FIRSTCUP15. It means a lot to me. It helps offset the cost of all the things that we do. I'll see you on Monday. Take care, everybody. Peace.